Hey guys, welcome to the Garbage Time Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Nolan. Today, I'm joined by producer Dave. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. What's up? Not a lot. Coming up in a bit, you'll hear my chat with this week's guest, Mike Liam Black. He was on the show last night, but he also stuck around. He did the podcast. We had a really interesting talk about his career, so that's coming up in a little bit. But first, we should probably talk about why I sound like a like a dead person. That We went to the Emmys. Yeah, we did. The Emmys were on t- Tuesday night. Yep. I don't think I've slept since then, because we won an Emmy! Yes, we did. We won an Emmy. Congratulations. Congratulations to you. Amazing. Uh, <coughs> I'm dying. Uh, we won an Emmy for Outstanding Social TV Experience, uh, which was a really cool Emmy. It's the one I wanted to, well, I mean, obviously wanted to win Outstanding Studio <laughs> Show Weekly, but we knew that wasn't going to happen. Uh, it's a cool category to win. It's a new category. Um, I think it speaks to our audience and the kind of stuff we like to do. So sure. it was really, really awesome, and it was um, very true to us and in our show and, and what we what we want for our show and how much we care about like you guys and the podcast and Twitter and all the stuff that we do. So that alone is this is the speech I probably should have given. That's right. You're uh, gonna give it now. As you know, I didn't give a good speech. <laughs> so here's what happened. So I was supposed to go to the Emmys early because I was presenting four categories with my good friend Kevin Burkhart who is the man. Uh, and so I was supposed to, they originally told me to go there at 4.15 right. for rehearsal. <laughs> we had a meeting, a Fox Sports meeting from three to four. So 4.15 was gonna be rehearsal. And then the Emmys, I was supposed to be at them at like six. You get there at five for cocktails, they start at seven. So I'm like, I have to put on like a dress and do my face and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I can't go to the Emmys after going to this rehearsal and then like not look, whatever. So. It was my first Emmys. I wanted to like look kind of nice. So I'm like, I can't do a 4.15 rehearsal. And they're like, you know what? No worries. Just get to the Emmys at 6. So I was like, okay. So then we'll go, like, we'll go backstage, we'll rehearse then, and you'll be fine. So went to my little Fox meeting, went to my hotel, hung out with my girls, got all done up, drank a little bit of champagne. Yeah. Just to like calm my nerves. I'm like, yeah. I'm presenting categories and... The script I had seen said, Katie and Kevin enter stage, <laughs> ad lib, oh. and the nominees are. I'm oh, like, well, ad lib? That's thanks. not a, a script. What no. are we supposed to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like so. freaking out. I'm like, I guess I'll have a little champagne, get a little loose. Makes we sense. got nominated for two Emmys. This is exciting. Yeah. So I go downstairs to the lobby to meet the people I'm supposed to meet before I head over, our group of people from Fox. And we get into the car that's supposed to take us over there. Now, we're a couple blocks away from where we're supposed to go for the Emmys, but I am in heels that are already hurting, and they've been on my feet for five minutes. And so I am a dick and was like, can we please just take a cab? I am, I can't. So we get in the cab. Somebody tells the driver we're going to Jazz at Lincoln Center. He starts driving away from where I know we have to go. I'm like, I don't know what's happening. He's going way up and we're in like the 60s or something. And finally, someone in the back seat's like, where are we going, sir? And he's like, Lincoln Center. Ooh. We'll just cut through the park. And meanwhile, we're trying to cut through the park and there's a line of traffic. Of course. Uh, and the guy's like, no, jazz at Lincoln Center. And I am still, as an idiot who, doesn't, who lives kind of in New York but doesn't know anything about it, I'm like, right. what does he mean? But that's what he said. And he goes, no, Jazz at Lincoln Center's in Columbus Circle. It's yes, behind it us. Is. It's next to where we just oh, were. Why yeah. did you take us this way? Oh. So we get to the Emmys after all the traffic. We get to the Emmys at 6.50. <laughs> and I'm like, cool. So missed that rehearsal yeah. uh, completely. And for once, wasn't really my fault. I was no. on time for where I was supposed to be. And my two people in the room with me, no, that's a crazy thing that I was yeah. there on time. Insane that I was there on you time. You should win an Emmy for that. Still was late. Still was late. <laughs> So I get there, they like, I check in at the check-in desk, and they're like, oh, Katie Nolan, get backstage. <laughs> they like clear a path for me. I'm like running through the, and I turned to the, the Emmy guy from Fox, who was amazing, Mark, uh, and I said, uh, grab me two drinks. <laughs> because the bar is open before the Emmys, and then it's closed for the Emmys. So I'm like, everybody else has been here since five, getting all loose. Nah, mama. No. Mama's been stuck in traffic in goddamn Lincoln Center. Yeah. Grab me two drinks. And he's like, what do you want? And I was like, Jameson and Ginger. 
So he comes back with, while I'm backstage with Kevin, and Kevin's very cool, calm, collected, been there for a fucking hour waiting for me, and doesn't even say, like, where the fuck were you? He's like, now nah, they walked me through everything, it's really easy, just, I'll, I'll carry it if you feel like you're confused, but I'm sure, like, it's totally fine. Yeah. So I'm like, great, awesome. Uh, what's his face comes back with three makers and ginger. Okay. Like, Close they didn't enough. have Jameson, so I got your makers. I'm like, don't care. Great. Thank you so much. Chugged uh, the first one. Hmm. Kevin was drinking a glass of wine, and then he, when that was done, he was like looking at my drinks. I'm like, Kevin, drink one. It's totally fine. Yeah. So he was sipping on that. We're standing backstage because the Emmys start. And so they bring us like to the actual backstage because there's like the backstage of backstage. There's just like hallways. And then there was the actual, like, you're in the wings. But if you haven't walked out to the stage, all you can see are like big curtains in front of you. So I didn't know where the stage was or like what was actually happening. So I'm standing back there. They start the Emmys, they do the opening, you know, statements or whatever. And then the director of the Emmys comes and stands with Kevin and I. And he's like, first of all, he goes, how's your dad? And I'm like, he's good. Have you met my father? What? My dad really wanted to go to the Emmys yeah. and kept asking me if I could find a way to get them tickets. And so I asked around and was like, Dad, I don't think they sell tickets to the public. Like, it's not like a real big, it's a big event in the industry, but right. I don't think you can just go. Yeah. But I'll try to find out. Asked around, people were like, no, that's weird. And I'm like, totally, I get it. So I told my dad, I don't think you can go. He's like, that's okay, that's fine. So then this man, flash forward, says, how's your dad? I'm like, he's good. Do you know my father? He's like, oh, I had a very long phone conversation with him. He was very excited about wanting to come to the Emmys. What? And I immediately was like, I, I am so sorry. Oh, my God. Because I know what those long phone conversations are. Oh, yeah? I know that this man now knows minute details about my <laughs> life, my mother's life, and my dad's That's life that amazing. my dad just says because he's on the phone and talking. Probably this could have been great. a three-minute conversation. I think he talked to the guy from the Emmys for like 45 minutes. That's incredible. So, guys, like, I don't know talk with your dad. So I'm already in this, like, yeah. oh, God, this is so mortifying. I already don't belong. And my father spoke to the director of the Emmys as, like, a, we're so proud of our little girl. Can we please get some tickets? I'm, like, chugging my drink at this point. So then he's walking us through, like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to go out there. You know, you can say some words or you could not say words, whatever you feel like doing. I'm, like, give me some clarity. Just tell me what to do. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm like listening to him and he's he's saying let's run through all of the nominees because you guys don't have to read them They had a video that would read the nominees But if you see a winner and you know if one of these people wins you have to be able to pronounce all the So he reads them all to you so you know the pronunciations right. which most of them were pretty basic But it was a smart thing for him to do so he's reading through the pronunciations and I hear you know they're on the third presentation of the third Emmy and which I know now in retrospect, but at the time I'm like really not paying attention because I'm trying to get this stuff right. Meanwhile, I've got kind of a bit of a buzz on. So <laughs> I hear them say, 30 for 30, I hate Christian Leitner. Mm -hmm. And I looked up and was like, what category is this? Because I knew we were against, because that's who I thought was going to win our category. Right. So I'm like, what category is this? And someone was like, oh, social TV. And as they're saying it, it says garbage time with Katie Nolan. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> I did not know our Emmy category was this early in the show. Like one through four, we were presenting five through plus four is nine. That's good. So like I, if, had I known, I would have like paid more attention. But I thought we were just going to, I don't know why. Right. It was based in no facts. I just wasn't prepared. It seemed right. like one of the Emmys you give away later or something like that. Right. So, well, I guess they give away the less important ones oh. early. So it does make sense. No, but anyway, so I'm standing back there. And I'm like, oh, wow, crazy. And then I look back at the director of the Emmys and I'm like, sorry, keep going. Yeah. Like, I just keep reading me the yeah, names because I'm, I'm about to go out and have to present these. So, like, <laughs> a, cool, there was our category. I heard people clapping when they said our name. And I was like, oh, that's really sweet. That means yeah. a lot to me. I'm sure it was just Chris Kirk. But uh, <laughs> it was really cool. So I go back to reading the names. And they say, and the winner is, or like, and the Emmy goes too. And Burkhart, like, tapped me of like, here we go. Oh, here's yeah. the moment. And they said, garbage time with Katie Nolan. And genuinely, like, my audio is about to peak. I'm warning you. I go, what? <laughs> I just, it was the first, it, as soon as they said the Emmy goes to, I just screamed, what? Like, as if someone has made an error. There is a mistake here. <laughs> screamed, what? And I think I dropped down. It, the only other time I blacked out from, like, being so surprised was the Rob Ryan thing. When mm -hmm. people afterwards were like, Katie, you got up on a chair. I'm like, did I? I do not remember doing that. And I watch back the Rob Ryan thing, and yeah. I'm like, I remember none of that. <laughs> That's what happened backstage at the Emmys. I, like, collapsed on the ground, I think. The control room of people to my left, like, 
We're like, is this girl okay? Just go get your fuck. So I'm standing there and I'm looking at the director and I'm looking at Kevin and I'm like, I can't believe this happened. I'm so, this is amazing. I'm so happy. Right. And they were like, go. <laughs> like, I'm like, wait, go where? They were like, go out on the stage and get your f- fucking, and like, what are you doing? Go get your Emmy. Oh, my God. And That's I was awesome. like, I, no, no, I don't want, come with me. <laughs> and I was like, I can't come with you. Go. And so I looked at them and I'm like, what, which way is the stage? <laughs> Kevin's like, oh my God. They like pushed me out the, the wings. I walk oh, out on the great. stage for the first time. Meanwhile, the sports army, they keep the house lights on the whole time. Oh. So when you're standing on stage, you see every famous person that's there. Like Vern Lundquist is staring at me and like going, who is this person? And why are no words coming out of her mouth? Like house lights that's on. Incredible. I step out on stage. I like hug Harold Reynolds. In like a, a lot, and he's just going, "Congrats!" It's like just a sports Emmy. Like you should really calm down. One <laughs> arrow. So I like take the Emmy, and I'm about to go up to start talking, and I'm still talking on the on the like they play a clip right. from your show. So I look up at <laughs> me on the TV, and I go, "Shut up!" <laughs> because I didn't want to stand there and like I'm still not comfortable standing on a stage at the Emmys in front of important people in this industry watching myself with yeah. poise, holding my Emmy, and then going, thank you all so much. Like, Her, that felt yeah. so uncomfortable, and I just wanted big, big projector big. Katie to <laughs> shut the fuck up so that little freaking out Katie could could get words out before the tears happened too yeah. much. So I, I went out and I said like, what? I think I said what a couple times. Yeah. Uh, I put the Emmy down on this little table. It was really fucking heavy. And I, the whole time I was giving my quote unquote acceptance speech, I kept looking at it like, is it gonna go away? Like, <laughs> stop staring at me. You're intimidating me. Oh, that's great. Uh, I thanked Pete Vlastelica because he's the man who yeah. hired me at Fox and I jokingly told him that I would. I'm like, oh, the day we win an Emmy, you'll be the guy I thank. And so I got that out, which like, Good job, Katie. You yep. checked that box. Thank God, because I would have felt like such an asshole. And you can't go back and do that again. Right. Um, and then it just felt so weird because I've, I think I've mentioned this before. You guys weren't there. You right. guys couldn't come. And like we went to Mike Nolan links to try to get everybody on the show tickets because like most Fox shows are in LA and ours is in New York and we're such a small team. Literally everyone could come yeah. and they would only take up like five seats. Mm-hmm. Like we, it was... We really, really tried and I ended up, I I had a plus one and I just raffled it off in the office because I didn't want to take anybody who wasn't associated with the show and I didn't want to pick one person and I wanted everybody to be there and it felt so weird to stand on stage and like talk about how I'm thanking everyone for this Emmy that I, look, it was us, it was a social thing and the video that we submitted to the Emmys to get this award was like a team effort that was crazy and like, Chris Kirk figured out all these crazy camera angles and I think Colette wrote the script and I had to memorize it and like Ashley did all this crazy social stuff and like everybody was participating in it and it felt really strange to stand there and be like, thank you so much, like this is a true honor. It was like, thank you, can I leave now? I want to drink with my friends. (laughs) And it was just, all I said was I was drunk, I thanked people with Stelica, I said everything I do is because of my team and then I Very went, cool. oh, okay, and I grabbed my Emmy and I left. I walked off stage. There's like two wings right next to each other. I don't know why it mattered, but I went through the back one and the girl who holds the Emmy for the night goes, um, excuse me, and then directed me to the other wing. And I was like, I just won and I have no idea what's happening. So I'm, I go off stage, someone takes the Emmy and the card that they give you out of my, my cold dead hand. I'm like, no. <laughs> no, it's mine. And I said, uh, Where's, oh, no, no, that was after. So they, they take the Emmy from me and I'm like, okay, they must be putting it down because I have to go out and present now. So I'm like, okay, just put it somewhere safe. I go out, I present with Kevin, which again, blacked out for, don't remember. Mm-hmm. I made a lot of liquor jokes. I kept saying that I had drinks backstage, okay. which became a running callback throughout the night. People would be like, uh, thank you so much for this. I heard there's Maker's Mark backstage, <laughs> so I'm gonna go get some. Look at you. Which was great, but I wasn't paying attention because, again, I was dead in my seat by the time that all happened. Right. So we go out, we present the awards. I made an SVP joke to SVP, and even SVP didn't laugh, which hurt a little bit for me. Because I was like, now that the lights are on and I have time to look around, I see a ton of famous people looking at me like, hello, SVP, and he waved. Uh, and I said, or is that just a guy who looks like SVP, which is that thing yes. they do on their show? Yep. And it was crickets. Oh. And I was like, cool, cool, thought I crushed that. Come on, but, bro. Um, 
just won an Emmy, so not not gonna yeah. care too much that that yeah. joke didn't land. And anytime a joke didn't land, I said, "Does everyone remember that I just won an Emmy?" Like this is my go <laughs> yes. my go to joke for the night. Perfect. So we gave out all these uh, awards, four of them. I don't remember much. Congratulations to all the winners. I was freaking out. I go off stage. I go, "Where's my Emmy? Where did yeah. every Where'd you guys put my Emmy?" And they all laughed. And I'm like, mm. "Guys, where's my Where's my Emmy?" They're like, that's just, it's a prop. We hand you the same Emmy that we hand everybody else. You come off stage, you give it back to us, and we bring it back out again. And I was like, oh, well, I want that Emmy. <laughs> I held that Emmy, and yeah. I want it. Uh, then they bring you over to a table, and they're like, hey, do you want to leave with an Emmy tonight, or do you want us to? And I was like, yes. Yeah. Cut them off. I'm like, yes, obviously, yes. I'd like it right now. They're like, well, we need you to sign it out. So I'm like, okay. And they're like, if you, you, it ha it's not going to be engraved, so you want to get it engraved. you got to go, and here's like all the information. I'm like, great. So I signed that. And like, there's a bunch of other stuff they make you sign, and I'm just signing like I'm uh, no idea what this is. I may have signed a contract back there. I have yeah, no I idea. Yeah, you have to write next year's. Yeah, I right. Yeah. I just signing, signing. Uh, we, I then I get whisked to the back. At this point, I'm like, I just wanted to be with Kevin, and I'm like, Kevin is gone. Kevin has left. Kevin is like has other shit to do. Yeah. And I'm like, doing the rounds. Then reporters, no, they bring you to do photos, and they're like, okay, take a couple smiling, and then take a couple freaking out or whatever. And so I did all that. And then they ask you if you, some, one of the girls was like, do you want to tweet one of these out right now? I'm like, fuck yeah, I do. She's like, all right, mm -hmm. which ones? And I was like, give me that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. She goes, okay, they're $35 a picture. I was like, oh, <laughs> all right, so, so just the one, I'll yeah. take just that one, uh, $35. She goes, do you want them retouched? Cause that's 75. What I'm like, no, I sure don't. Wow. Sure don't. Really exploiting like, sure any don't. winners. I'm like, I look, I think I look great. I'm glowing. I don't need you to retouch my face. Like, with $75 to tweet wow. out a picture. So she emails me a link to this photo that I have paid 35 fucking dollars. Yeah. And I tweeted it out, which was really cool. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm the only sucker who fell for that scam because I didn't yeah. see anyone else tweet out their photos. Then they make you one. sign another thing and like write your name and your like show and what you won for. And then, then they're like, do you want to talk to press? Ooh, I didn't even talk about the fact that when they give you your Emmy, they give you a coffin for it. It's yeah, a legitimate that's, coffin. It's kind of creepy. The woman was yeah. like, do you want a box for your Emmy? I'm like, fuck no, I want to carry it around all night. And then I was like, wait a second, free box. Yes, I want a box for my Emmy. It's a box that when you open it is like satin on the inside, like a coffin. And yeah. it has an <laughs> Emmy-shaped hole in it, like a coffin. <laughs> and you put the Emmy in it and you close the box forever and then you bury it like a coffin. So it's really, really cool. I got my Emmy coffin. I'm carrying around this huge box and people kept to be nice being like, I want me to hold that for you? And they, I wouldn't even let him finish the sentence. No, no, I don't want you to get, no, Miami I'm coffin. never putting it down. <laughs> then they ask, you want to do press? And like two dudes come over to you and just start asking you questions. And I'm like, A, I'm drunk, B, I'm in shock. So I'm like, I'm gonna say something really stupid. So I just kept saying, I'm, I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful, I really need to get back to my seat. I really need to pee, I'm sorry, I have to go. Uh, and like awful announcing. One of the guys asked me, like, I have to ask you about the new Fox hires. And I said, I, I, was, I was very proud of myself, very <laughs> diplomatic. Everything is fine. Uh, people, I keep running into people that are like, congratulations. And I'm like, thank you. I don't know what's happening. I go, I sit down at my seat and everybody's laughing that I still, that I'm holding my Emmy because like no one else keeps it. What? Like Bill We're Raftery not. doesn't win an Emmy and sit down and hold the box like an idiot. He acts like he's been there before and he lets someone else handle it. And if he never gets his Emmy, he doesn't really care. I was like clutching it all night long because I, I was so worried you. someone was going to realize that I didn't deserve to have it and they were just no. going to take it from me. So I just no sat there all night with it. Dude, yeah, you, that's not an embarrassing thing though. I mean, it's like, it's your first Emmy. Yeah. You have the right to be like, I am psyched about this I'm and I'm so not going to act like I've been here before. I'm going to do an end zone dance. And again, it might have been the drunkness, but I could have sworn that like, or maybe the guy was trying to be encouraging, but when I handed him back my Emmy, the first, when, it was, when I was about to go out to present, and I was like, don't go far with it. It means a lot to me. The guy said, well, you're going to be grabbing another one later. And he worked at the Emmys. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, did that dude just spoiler alert that we're about to win Best Studio Show Weekly? Which I never even thought we had a chance to. Mm -hmm. So then when they read the category, I was a little bit like sat forward in my seat. Like, oh my God, is this it? And then of course, of course not. College Game Day won. Of course College Game Day won. Yeah. We had no business being in that category. And it genuinely was one of those times where it was an honor to be nominated. Mm -hmm. But that guy, I'm like, what Dude. did he say to me? What did that mean? I think he meant like, get used to it. You're gonna get right. Emmys from now on. Nice but drunk guy. Katie was like, bro, did you just share trade secrets? Oof. Did you see inside the envelope? Ooh. He didn't see inside the envelope. No. We lost. So that's a 75 one. minute story. Thank you for listening to the to the to the podcast. This has <laughs> been really fun for me to tell you this stupid story. Um, 
I'm sure everyone loves hearing that, though. It's cool to get the play-by-play of what that night was like for you because it it's awesome. So you should crazy. be so psyched and I so proud. I still have, because then, I mean, Wednesday we had a show to do. We did. So Tuesday night after the Emmys, when everyone's standing around, they, everyone kind of stands in the lobby after it's over and, like, shakes hands and, you know, you meet people. I met Bill Raftery's wife, by the way, who oh. is the sweetest woman in the world. Not surprised Said she that. watches our show and oh. that she's so proud of us. Like, it was That's the sweet. cutest. She was so kind. Um, you met Shaq, right? Yeah, met Shaq. I met Shaq when I was leaving from presenting. He was waiting in the wings to go out with Ernie Johnson, who also was so sweet and, and awesome. nice. And I shook Shaq's hand. I said, good luck out there. Tough crowd. But watch Garbage Time. Katie Nolan. It's on TV. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're never going to get a chance to talk yeah. to Shaq again. Let him know what your show is called so he can find it. Awesome. Um, Strong move. So I'm like standing out there and like everyone's mingling and it's really, really cool. But I just, someone was like, why are you just staring off in the distance? And I was like, can we go? Oh. I'm like, all of my friends, all of my team, we're all, they're all waiting at a bar. Can we go? Please, can we go? And they're like, wow, okay. You didn't want to like go talk to, you know, such no. and such or this guy or that guy. No, I just want to, I really want to go. I, it was, it's really, it would be cool to meet them, but I just really want to go. And they were like, oh, okay. So like we left before everybody else got into a cab. I go to the bar. I walk up. It's all Fox people. And I'm like pushing through. I'm like, where are my friends? You guys weren't there yet. No, because we thought that you were going to be there much yet. longer. You guys weren't there yet. Yeah. I get what you're saying that yeah. you thought I was going to take longer to get yeah. there. That's fair. But you were going to that bar from a bar. Yeah. There was no reason to stay at that other bar. There, there was. There the was. Spurs game? The Spurs Thunder game was oh, going on. God, I was I devastated it. by the outcome of it, but it was one of those things where like, there's two minutes left in the game. Let's just like finish watching here. Because we know that's not going to take an hour. Yeah. So that is part of the reason. So I'll take some blame for that. Some. You um, see, he'll take some blame, <laughs> Ashley. <laughs> I um. was pushing through like Eric Shanks, <laughs> important people. Like, yeah, talk to you later. Where's my people? Yeah. My best friend Hannah was there. Yeah. Thank God, because if she wasn't, I would have immediately just cried of like, why the fuck is no one here? <laughs> and I did cry anyway, because Hannah was like crying. I'm like, oh my God, I can't oh, believe uh, And then like 40 minutes later, you guys showed up, which I was still really excited. Be, I got to cry great. again. It was awesome. It was so good. Such it a was, cool, awesome So we moment. stayed there till like two. Not you, you always bounce early. But we stayed there pretty late. Uh, I left drunk. Uh, in those heels still that were fucking killing me. And I went and I got in a cab. And the cab's like, where are you going? I told them my hotel because I, I didn't remember where that was because it was earlier in the day and I wasn't paying attention. I didn't remember where we were now because I just took a cab there and I was blacked out. So I get in the cab. I tell him my hotel. He laughs a little. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, I'm a little drunk guy. Maybe I slurred. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, he was laughing because we were two blocks from that <laughs> hotel. And not avenue blocks, like street blocks. Wow. He drove two streets, made a right, and went, you're here. And I was like, oh, shit. I am so sorry. He goes, I get paid either way. I was like, okay, cool. Went into my Great hotel, passed out, woke up super late because I didn't set an alarm. Uh, came to work and had to do the show. Yeah. So I haven't really, point is I have like emails and texts and like things, people I need to talk to. I haven't spoken to my mother on the phone yet. Oh. Like I, I need to talk to yeah. him, but I, we haven't had a day. Like today's the first day where we kind of have less to do, but actually because of something we found out last night that we can't say yet, we have a lot to do yeah. for next week's show. So uh, I haven't had a minute and this must be what like, Erin Andrews' life is always like, she just never has a minute. No, get used to this. No, this yeah, sucks. I want to like <laughs> call people and talk to people and like also feels really weird to reply to 19 texts in a row saying, thank you so much. You feel disingenuine. I want to write everybody something specific and unique, but I'm like, oh my God, I have so many people to like get back yeah. to. And you should definitely call your mom as soon as we're done with this. I have to call okay. my mom. I'm making you do that. And I have so many other people I should thank for like winning an Emmy, but it just feels like, it was a social TV Emmy. I don't know that like people were saying our show was really good, so I'll just thank those people after for when we get another one for our show being really good. Cool. Awesome, Some people dude. are mad I didn't thank them, which is always a weird reaction because I only I only thanked one person. Yeah, I, that's that's just not fair for people to be like, like in that moment, and now you're going through it, and you watch all these award shows, and you kind of wonder like. Oh my God! I can't believe that person didn't thank so and so, like their co-star, their I director, didn't even thank my mom their or my husband. Dad. I know, but like now you get right. Like you were probably like, yeah. the emotions you're going through. You probably get what those people who win Oscars are going through. And people told me beforehand, you know? they're like, write some stuff down because you're gonna black out. You're gonna get up there and you're gonna wish you had something written. And I, I was like, yeah, I get what you're saying, but at the same time, 
if I have something written, it looks very much like I was like, yeah, we're going to win. Yeah. And I did not in at all think we were going to win. And writing something felt really weird, so it didn't. And now, I, that person was right. I should have written something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay, that's it. But, like, big ups to Fox and everybody for making that night great. Mark Ruberg for taking personal care of me all night and getting me to you guys, even though I, I should have probably stayed for a little because you guys weren't <laughs> even fucking there. <laughs> Heather Munson, who works at Fox. I don't know if either of you have ever met her, but she's mm. so amazing and was so excited about Fox being nominated for so many Emmys, and it was really cute. And Eric Shanks for... Um, challenging me that I couldn't chug out of it. He's like, yeah, too bad you can't drink out of it. And then I put a beer into the Emmy and I chugged it. A lot of people ask me what kind of beer it was. I don't know. Because when I got there, Mystery. a bunch of people were like, want a drink? And I said, yup. And I just had three. The only one I ordered or when someone said, what do you want? I said, Jack and Coke. Um, I don't even really drink that. It was just there. I got just... whatever. I, it was the first thing I could think of. Uh, and then, or maybe I said Jameson and Ginger. Again, I don't know. Uh, okay, we're gonna move on. Before we do that, obviously, let's talk about SeatGeek. Right. The dopest ticket app out there. Uh, as I've told you guys before, I've been using it for my ticket needs. It's just my go-to now. Like, yeah. I don't go to a lot of things other than the Emmys. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But like, I, it's what I use when I want tickets. Now when I have time to go to something, I just go, oh, I'll check SeatGeek. Uh, and it's fantastic, easy to use. I use it on hockey tickets. I searched Emmys on it when my dad wanted tickets. Smart. They, they uh, rightfully so, did not have that hookup, as neither did the director of the Emmys. But like, it was, it was the first thing I thought was like, let me check Seeky. Good thought. Because they take all the work and hassle out of shopping for tickets. They make it easy. They pull all the tickets available on other sites into one place. So you have time, uh, you save time, and you never miss a deal. You can set alerts for upcoming events. So if you know what you like, tell them, and they'll let you know when it's coming to you. Uh, and they'll also let you know when ticket prices fall, which is nice, because who wants to pay more money? Not this guy. No. Uh, you can use their map to see the like a detailed view from your seat, so you'll know if it's obstructed, and you won't be surprised when you get there, which is always nice. Um, and they're always honest and upfront about their price. Unlike StubHub, uh, they show you the full ticket price from start to finish. It's not like you go to check out, and there's all these fees you never knew about, and you're paying four times as much as you thought you were. Uh, and what we were talking about before, they rank the tickets based on the value, Love so that. not just like by what's cheaper, but also like what you're, what, like the bang for the buck. So that's really cool. Okay. And you guys get a twenty dollars rebate off your first SeatGeek purchase. To get that, download the free SeatGeek app, go to the settings tab, and click add a promo code and a promo code Katie, and SeatGeek will send you twenty dollars after you've made your first ticket purchase. Download the free SeatGeek app and enter promo code Katie today. Uh, all right. So earlier this week, I chatted with comedian, actor, uh, writer, everything, podcaster. <laughs> Michael Ian Black about his career. Uh, if you watched the show last night, then you saw we did a bit that he <laughs> completely bought in on and was amazing at. Yeah. I wish we could put the full unedited thing out because it was very fun. Yeah. Uh, so we, anyway, he stuck around for the podcast, which is really cool of him. Uh, and we were we got into more you know genuine conversation rather than you know a funny comedy bit. But it was really interesting. We talked about his career, which has gone all over the place. Uh, how he got started on the state how he deals with shows that he's on being canceled, his presence on Twitter, and why he hates superhero movies. Hot fucking take. Uh, take a listen. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. You have a podcast called How To Be Amazing, and you talk to creative people to find out you know, how they got to where they are and, and how they do what they do. So this is exciting for me to be able to turn the tables on you. But first I wanna ask you, what is the, the coolest thing you've learned about being creative from talking to creative people about being creative? Uh, um, the coolest thing is that it's accessible to anybody, meaning whatever it is you're pursuing, it's accessible to you. You can do whatever it is you want to do. Uh, it's, it's mostly a question of diligence and persistence. You may not get to the level of Lin-Manuel Miranda, but you can pursue what you want to do and, and do it with some success. When in your life did you realize that you wanted to perform, that it's what you loved? Uh, nine, age nine. Literally remember that it was age nine. Mm -hmm. What, what? It was a play at summer camp. Yeah. Uh, that I did because I liked a girl in the play and, uh, and, and ended up enjoying performing as much as I enjoyed the girl. Did you get the girl? Uh, I did get the girl. I did get the girl. Congrats. At nine, I don't really know what that means. I know. Um, kiss her on the cheek? We, no, we did. I think we did have one kiss. Ooh. Uh, and then a lot of doggy style. <laughs> Makes sense. 
I was 10 when I finally mm -hmm. dabbled. Uh, now, what's your background? Are you sports journalism background? No, God, no. Uh, I started on YouTube making comedy videos because I wanted to tell jokes for a uh -huh. living, uh, but I was too afraid to do stand up. And so I, I did it from my house. And then uh, they launched this network and asked me to do like Twitter stuff. And I was like, sure, but I also want to do like sports comedy stuff. And then they kind of gave me a show. Like, I kind of have a show. This. Yeah. But like, it's like you said, like we film it on an iPhone. So right. It's not really a show. But, but like you're nominated for an Emmy. Two. Two Emmys. <laughs> do they have to give you a raise? Uh, that's a great question that I will find out. Probably not. But if all the commercials win, now say Emmy nominated, which yeah. is pretty sweet. If you win, they have to give you a raise. Yeah, but we're not going to win. Who are you up against? Oh, okay. So we're uh, nominated for Best Studio Show Weekly. And we're up against uh, small shows. Uh, Football Night in America. Uh-huh. Uh, College Game Day. Uh-huh. NBA on TNT. And uh, Fox NFL Sunday. Well, it's an honor just to be nominated. It really is. Like, in this case, it genuinely was just to be named next to all those shows that have billion-dollar budgets. Right. And we have hundred-dollar budgets. It's pretty sweet. You're really good at interviewing people. I have to interview you now. <laughs> Uh, something that really interests me, like I was saying, I like to tell jokes and stuff, but for me it was hard and it took a while for me to f you know, find my comedic voice. I still don't know that I have. But you have a very distinct voice, um, not like vocally, but just you know, your, your sense of humor. How did you find that? What was, was it a long process, short? Did you know right away? Uh, it has been a continual process. It continues to evolve and it, a lot of it uh, was uh, deliberate and a lot of it was not. So my uh, stoicism, let's say, is sort of innate and um, that has to do with just being unhappy most of the time. And then um, the rest of it, I just sort of developed over the years and, uh, and continued to hone I don't think it ever stops because I think your voice changes over time. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, your life has changed since you started. You know, you got married, had kids, and does your voice change when, like, events in your life? Is what you find funny now very different from what you found funny then? I don't think so. I think people's sense of humor sort of has evolved by the time they're 12, and then it sort of freezes there. Uh, it, it, it gets maybe more nuanced, but I think I find the same things funny now that I did. Uh, let's see, I'm 26, so 14 years ago. <laughs> Me too, 23. Uh, what, when you were first starting out, what was the worst on-stage experience you had? Was it like, could be stand-up, could be a play? Just an awful memory you have. Um, when The State was first starting out, that was my original sketch comedy troupe. We, uh, we decided that it would be fun to do sketch comedy in Washington Square Park one day. And we were so wrong about that. Mm. It was not fun or funny at all. It was uh, very, very uncomfortable for us and for the three or four people who stopped to watch us. Just a terrible, terrible idea. Did you keep going? Plow oh, I think it? we did. I'm sure we did. You didn't just bail? Oh, no. I mean, we, we, were, we were so committed, uh, so much more committed to sketch comedy than, uh, than we had any reason to be. I mean, why would you commit to sketch comedy? It's a stupid thing to commit to. But I we did. That was a cool thing. Was this before the TV show? Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is before the TV show. This is when we were just a college club. Yeah. And so you went to Washington Square Park. And did our little show. Were you next to or like on the other side of the pigeon guy? You know the pigeon guy. I don't know the pigeon guy. He like does tricks with pit. Oh, with he the wasn't pigeons. there when we were there. Oh, oh all right. This is a, the pigeon guy is in, in the last couple decades. Oh, wow. You predate the pigeon guy. I think so. You're OG Washington Square Park. That's what that means. But I remember when I was a kid going to Washington Square Park and seeing performers, and I knew, and that's why I went to NYU because when I was a kid, I went there and I was like, oh, this is where I want to go to college because there's a guy riding a unicycle. So that was enough for me. Well, you should always pick your college <laughs> based on. Uh, let's talk about the state because a lot of people know you from that sketch show on MTV in the '90s. But obviously, a group of people that you've worked with and kept in touch with throughout the years. How did you guys form that group? It was a uh, it was a college club. It was it was an offshoot of a different sketch comedy club that existed at NYU at the time, and we just put it together. We didn't. Uh, it was initiated by a guy named Todd Hollebeck, who was in the state, and 
he kind of put the thing together and then sort of stood, stepped back and let us run ourselves, and that's what we did. Did you have to, were there auditions? There were did auditions, and there were meetings, and there were uh, rehearsals. And performances was, in Washington Square Park. There were performances Square in Washington Square Park. Mm. It was, most of my college experience was doing sketch comedy with that group, far more than going to classes or anything else. That's what I did with my time. It seems like it was probably a good investment. Yeah, look at me now. Time. Yeah, on garbage time. I mean, nominated Lucky. garbage time. I love you so much. What was that like for you being in your early 20s and you're on this show that's developing a, a cult following? Well, uh, uh, I couldn't really enjoy it. Uh, I knew it was special and I knew it was uh, gonna be an important moment in my life but there was, you know, I was just too young to enjoy it, and there was too much pressure, and there were a lot of like difficult group dynamics. Um, so my overriding memory of it was just the 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 pace and the stress, and we had a good time too. Um, but it's not like it's not like I was out partying and getting laid and being fetid. Uh, it just didn't exist like that. It was it was just a lot of work. Yeah. What did you have a favorite sketch? Um, yeah, there were a couple of things that I really like in retrospect. Um, I can't watch myself, so nothing that really? I really no. Like still to this day. No, wow. it's worse now than it was then. Why is that? Because I'm older now. No, I mean, and I why was can't younger you watch then. Yourself? Because I because uh, I don't I don't like my own performances. So I watch myself and I'm like, ooh, that was a bad choice. Or ooh, you shouldn't have done it that way. Or ooh, tone it down, Michael, tone it down. Uh, I was always too big in the state. I did too much. Mm. I've subsequently toned it way down. Now I don't do enough, as evidenced in this interview. Yeah. Now you just sit. I sit and mostly. And stare. Yes. Uh, so your favorite sketch you were saying? Uh, well, one is called Porcupine Racetrack, which was a big musical number that we did. Uh, and one was called uh, Cutlery Barn, which has no plot, makes no sense, um, but is one of the funniest things I think we did. Why did you think it was so funny? I ju it just, it, just the, the stupidity of it never failed to crack me up. Um, it's just four heads in a black space talking to each other, but looking past each other, talking about a new store that's opened. And then, the, then a talking sandwich comes up and ends the sketch. That makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> it made perfect sense at the time. Deus Ex Sandwich. Yes. Like a known device. It's, yes, the Greeks did it first, the Deus yeah. Ex Sandwich, uh, <laughs> and uh, that, that always made me laugh. Was everything always collaborative for you guys, or mm -hmm. was there ever a time where someone was like, I don't think that's funny, and most of you said, ah, we're doing it anyway. Oh, no, no, it was always somebody saying, I don't think it's funny, and I hate this, and I hate you, but <laughs> it was always, collaborative, nobody was in charge. So it, it made things very, very difficult because, and great. It was great because everybody had a say, but it was hard because everything required a fucking meeting. Yeah, so, meetings are the worst. Ugh. Nobody tells you about that when you're a kid. No. That the worst thing about being an adult. It's just having to go to a meeting. All the fucking meetings and the conference calls. The conference calls are worse than the meetings. But I have a new strategy with conference calls. What is it? Don't say anything. I just go on mute the yeah. whole time. Yeah, uh, if somebody somebody will say, "Well, Katie, what do you think about that?" and you just go, you just go "I agree." Yeah, sounds mute. good, guys. Sounds good. Mute. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Mute. Yep. Every time. Yeah, I do. I do a lot of. If I have to speak, it's a compliment. Like, mm. uh, thank you so much. That's great feedback. <laughs> totally wrote that down. We'll consult later. Mute. Yep. And then back to like not even in the same room as my phone. <laughs> I just know when there's silence, it's like, oh, they're waiting for me to speak. So I run in and I'm like, yep, good, good. Keep it up. Yeah, we'll Mute. consult. Clean in the bathroom. Perfect. What would you say the biggest thing you learned from, from doing the state, the show on MTV? Um, uh, uh, probably a similar lesson as in How to Be Amazing, which is that persistence pays off, that the harder you work at something, the more likely you are to have success with it. And we really, we worked our asses off with the state. We really worked hard. Um, and it paid off. So obviously, you went on to do a ton of stuff yep. after that. And I mean, like, a, a ton. You've done so much stuff. I know. I just want to make I was sure there. you know. I know. But you never watched it, so no. I want to make sure you know it exists. <laughs> 
I've, it's cool to know that I've probably watched more of you than you have. That's almost you've certainly watched, true. Yeah. If you've watched anything that I've been in, it's almost <laughs> certainly true. Uh, but you've you've been doing this for 25 years. You've been in the business uh-huh. around there. Uh, you did TV, movies, podcasts, books. What do people, when they come up to you and say, oh my God, you're Michael Ian Black from... Kids in the Hall. Yeah, that's the most... <laughs> yeah, the thing I was never in. Mm. I get that a fair amount. Mm. Oh my God, you're in Kids in the Hall. Yep. I say, yep. And then... Continue Move walking. On. Yep. Why do you think that is? That people think I was in Kids in the Hall? Yeah. Do you think it was, it was similar to the state? It was, a, it was on at a similar time, and I have a vaguely Canadian vibe about me. Mm. <laughs> and you would fit in with those, with yeah. those guys? I know those guys that's now. That's your vibe. Very nice yeah. guys. Yeah. It's your sense of humor. So you just say, yep. Anytime anybody asks me if I was in anything, I say yes. Because it ends the conversation much quicker. Mad TV? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Big SNL? Bang Theory, absolutely. <laughs> SNL, yes. Whatever they want me to be in, I will be your Huckleberry. I will do whatever you want me to, to do. Is there? Is it possible that someone would remember something you were in that you didn't even remember that you did? No. You remember everything you've ever done? Well, maybe not specifically, but if you if you were to say, like, like maybe not a specific sketch or a specific scene, yeah. but if you were to say a specific show, yeah. Because, I mean, there was like... You're not going to stump me on my career, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. But there was like, I love the 80s. Right. And then there was, I love the 80s strikes back. Right. And there was, I love the 90s. And I love the 90s part de, uh-huh. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was, I, I love the... What were the other ones? There was, a, there was an I love holidays. There was an I love toys. There was a 3D there one. There was, I love the 80s 3D. I mean, that's a lot. Did you have to go in all separate times to film all those? Or do you just go in one time and then they and, and they're they, like, let's do 80s. Okay, hour three, moving on to 90s. No, no, no. You go in every separate time. Wow, that's a lot of times. It's a lot of times. It's a lot of times. Uh, it was a lot. You should just have a, a studio in your house that you could do that from. Uh, that would be great. I mean, that's kind of what this is like. Yeah. <laughs> I do live it's, here. Except it's more like a dentist's office than anything else. It's a nice aesthetic that we're going for. Uh, it's like reception area meets... Television studio. There's like a shitty college next door. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what that college is. It's it, Empire State College. It yeah. says so. But it what, says what it is. What is that? It's a college. Like a real college? I didn't see a guy outside on a unicycle, so I don't know why anyone would go here. <laughs> Very confusing. Of everything you've done in your career that you just said you remember, you remember all of it, which project are you the proudest of? I don't know. None of it. Uh, no, it's not not none of it, but but um, I, I I'm I may be fondest of Stella, which was our short lived television series on Comedy Central. Uh, nobody, when I say nobody, I mean America, didn't care for it, but I thought it was hilarious. What country was fond of it? None. None oh. countries. Oh, when you said America, I thought you were going to be like, it only Japan. aired. In, no, it only aired in America. Oh. None none of the other countries wanted it. And neither did America. Mm. It didn't last very long, but I thought it was great. That sounds similar to, to this to this show. How long have you been doing this? Uh, this is the the season three. How many do you do in a season? Twenty. Uh-huh. But we just started, so you know, you never you never know. Getting an Emmy nod. Yeah, you know, that's pretty pretty cool. Where do you want to go? In my life. Yeah. What's next for you? Uh, well, ideally, this would be like a late night show that we do once, uh, like like daily, as opposed to once a week. Oh, why don't they do that? Because uh, we don't have the means to at the moment. What do you need besides this? The ability to do. We have like six people that work here, so writing a show for every day would be tough. Right. You want a job? Nope. Yep. Okay. <laughs> well, that kind of leads to my other question, though. Is you know, I was on one other TV show before this ever, and it got canceled. Um, and obviously that was my first experience in TV and I didn't know what I was supposed to feel, but I felt pretty devastated and sad. And That's like what you're was, supposed to feel. Yeah. What kept you going when things that you really liked, just no mas? Well, what choice do you have? You could quit and give up. And do what? I don't know. What would I do? Work at a Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't have any, any particular skills. And this, uh, certainly no skills that are going to pay me what I make when I'm employed in show business, yeah. you know, what am I gonna do? Teach? Help people? Fuck, no. It's exhausting. Ugh. How do you stay creatively motivated, I guess? I don't, I'm not creatively motivated at all right now. Can't you tell? I can, that's, yeah. but that's my fault, not yours. You're not, you're not helping things. No, yeah, certainly <laughs> not. So you, I mean, 
genuinely, do you, is there a time period after something gets taken away that you liked that gets canceled that you sit and are like, I'm just going to be sad for a little bit? Yeah, I give myself a day. One day. One day. And then the next day. Back at it. Back at it. Where do you come up with all these ideas that you have? Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, you suck a, a man's, a small penis. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I just, I, I, I don't know. I'm good at having ideas. I'm not good at executing them. You know? Yeah. I'm pretty good at just thinking of things and then <laughs> into the toilet. Sometimes. Sometimes. A lot of times. Sometimes it's, it, it goes well, though. Yeah. What, is there a project that you specifically remember you're, you were most disappointed in or that didn't turn out how you wanted it to be? Uh, there was a show we did called Viva Variety, which was a fake European television variety show. I remember that. Which I think is a good show. Um, but it never quite got to where I wanted it to go and I didn't know how to get it there. And that was always really frustrating for me. And it was successful. I mean, we did a bunch of them. But I just, it never quite gelled for me. And what's the one project you were like, this is going to be a hit? Oh, I thought Stella was going to be a hit. Yeah. I could not have been more wrong. What did you love about it? I just thought it was... Uh, it was smart and silly in the best ways. I thought it was really smart and stupid. And, uh, and that's, that's a combination that I like a lot, but that uh, other people did not. They just saw the stupid. They, mm. thought it, they thought it was, I think they thought it was sort of thoughtlessly stupid instead of thoughtfully stupid. Yeah. And um, that seemed to make all the difference. So they were just dumb. No, we were dumb for thinking people would like it. I think it was our fault. But if they I, don't see the smart, I mean, do you ever get frustrated with viewers of like, how don't you get what we're doing? No, nah, I don't blame viewers. Uh, you know, it's just you do what, you do the best that you can, and you put it out there, and either people like it or they don't. I don't, I don't. You can't control it. So I don't. I, don't, I think people are actually generally, audiences I think are generally pretty smart, but um, for whatever reason, they just didn't key into what we were doing. More with Michael in a minute, but I want to tell you guys about Casper Mattresses, obsessively engineered mattresses at a shockingly fair price. An in-house team of engineers spent thousands of hours developing the Casper, combining springy latex and supportive memory foams to create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. Plus, its breathable design sleeps cool to help regulate your temperature throughout the night. Time Magazine named it one of the best inventions of 2015. That's crazy. It's yeah. a mattress. It had to be a really cool mattress to be called an invention. In fact, it's now the most awarded mattress of the decade. Other mattresses can cost well over $1,500, but Casper mattresses cost $500 for a twin, $750 for a full, $850 for a queen, and $950 for a king. And you can try Casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home, and if you don't love it, they come pick it up and give you your money back, refund you everything. They offer free shipping and returns to the US and Canada, and they're made in America. Don't know what else you want from a mattress. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash garbage time and using code garbage time, all one word, no spaces. At checkout, terms and conditions apply. All right, back to Michael Ian Black. What is the most fun you've had in the business working on a project? Mm. Obviously, second to, to now no, is no, what no. I mean. No, not now. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I've gotten I've I've gotten better at having fun as I've gotten older. Like when I, it wasn't fun for me for a long time. Uh, I didn't know how to have fun with it. It was just it was just always just pressure, pressure. Um, but lately, I feel like I'm better just relaxing into things and enjoying them. Um, I think that just comes with age. Uh, as I said, like I'm I'm going to be thirty in a few years, and <laughs> I think you just you know you just mature. Yeah, you've been in the business for 25, so you started when you were five. It's just crazy. Mm -hmm. That was before you did all that doggy style at mm -hmm. camp. It was just crazy. Uh, you said it wasn't fun for you. I feel like that's a thing a lot of, of people who work in the comedy business say, that it's not necessary. They're not doing it because they're, they enjoy it. They almost do it because they, they feel like they have to. St uh, yeah, I think that might be true for some stand-ups. I think, feel like I've heard that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but part of it was, it, it was, I felt compelled to do it. I think that's true for me. Uh, I still feel compelled to do it to a certain extent, but uh, I feel like I'm able to uh, separate a little bit better and have distance from the work and, and sort of relax into my life a little bit better than I, than I could back then. Which is good. This is a, a weird one, but it will, I think it will help people, especially myself. 
Is there a mistake you made in your career that you look back on that you're that you wish you you did something differently and and what did you learn from it and how did you you know change from that? Um, I called the CEO of MTV a drunk to her face. Mm. That didn't go well. No. Was she a drunk? I think she may have been, mm. but I didn't. I wasn't being sincere when I said it. I was joking. Right. But I think because she was a drunk. Yeah. Had she not been, it would have been like, ha, ah, I right, get it. She, right. She would have thought it was funny, but I think she might have, may have been. Mm. That was a mistake. Don't do that. Then what you learned from that was? Don't, don't call your boss a drunk. You hear that, guys? Don't call me a drunk. <laughs> you asked this to guest on your podcast, so I want to ask you best advice you've ever received and worst advice you've ever received. Uh, best advice is, um, uh, professionally speaking, be early. Not personally. Don't go to parties early. Oh, yeah, no. That's Don't do that. Idea. No. But professionally, show up early. Be 10 minutes early. That's just, that's, that, that will make your life so much easier, and people will think that you're easy. Not easy, you know what I mean, easy professionally. Not a, not a difficult professional person. Mm -hmm. And then worst advice, uh, get a teaching degree. Do you have a teaching degree? No. Oh. Who told you to do My that? My mom. Why? Because she's like, because she thought nobody could make a living in show business, so you should have, have people making a living teaching. Yeah, teachers. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> does that make sense? <laughs> I mean, I, what, what did you want? Was that what you wanted to do? No. If it wasn't this. No, no. It seems like a random career. Well, no. I mean, I think a lot of people who pursue the arts get that advice. Have your have your backup plan. Yeah. Have your have your fallback position. But I knew that if I had a fallback position, I was much more likely to fall back on that position right. as opposed to just being forced to do what I said I was going to do. So that's what I did. So you're pot committed. I was pot committed. Yeah. I was all in. Right. No chips left on the table. There were no chips on the table. All the chips were, were in, in the, the middle, middle of, the, of table. the table. Yes. And you were like, those are all my chips? Right. right. I'm all in. Right. There's no I mean. more chips. Right. Can you buy, can I buy in again? No. Nope. Because the chips, again, are in right. the center, all of them in right. the table. I think people got what we were saying. I just wanted to make sure. You're really active on Twitter. You have 2 million followers. It is a lot of followers. It's 1.99. Uh, well, we it's, round up. It, uh, it's been a source of continuing frustration to me. Really? That I can't get it over that hump. Well, when you get the garbage time bump and our 12 <laughs> listeners follow you, we're gonna push you right over the edge, <laughs> one way or the other. Uh, it's at Michael Ian Black, if anybody wants to follow. I mean, I imagine if they, they probably already do. But the majority of your tweets are jokes. Uh -huh. But lately, you've been getting kind of serious with some Trump tweets. Uh -huh. How do you balance when you're gonna tweet something serious or when you're gonna tweet something funny? I don't give a fuck. You just tweet what you're thinking. Yeah. yeah. This is my free service to you. I know, but people are so precious about oh, it. Oh God, it's the worst. I know. Uh, be funny, funny man. Fuck yeah. you. I'll say whatever I want. This is not, this is not, you haven't paid for this. Right. And you're free to unfollow at any time. But please don't because do, we're so close to two minutes. So close. <laughs> I try not to put pressure on myself to be anything other than whatever I want to be in that moment on Twitter. Because my God, yeah. it's, this, this doesn't matter. This stuff doesn't matter at all. At all. So I just tweet whatever I want. And so how do you feel about being political? If that's what I'm thinking about, then that's what I'll write about. Yeah. I, I give myself permission to just do whatever I want. That's good. Yeah. I, 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 I wish I could do that. Well, what do you tweet about? Well, so sometimes I'll, I mean, I've got a network that will tell me like, yeah, you really shouldn't <sighs> tweet that because it looks bad for us. <sighs> I know. But, you know, at the same time. I keep waiting for somebody to say that to me. And, yeah. Yeah. You, you I know. could say it to you if you You're want. on the Jim Gaffigan show. Jim's a family friendly comedian. Yeah. Why no, so no one's said that to you about any of the things nope. you've been on? Nope. They don't care. They, I, they, I don't think so. I feel like once you've reached that many followers, you sort of get, for lack of a better pardon the pun, uh, a trump card that really no one can tell you what you can and can't do because you, you have all these followers that have stuck around. I hope. I don't know. Nobody, no, nobody's told me what to, what to do, thank, thankfully. Yeah. How would you react to someone telling you what to do? I'd say, uh, fuck you, and then I'd probably do whatever they asked. Oh, that's good. Like, you're a drunk, but I will follow your rules. Your stand-up special, Noted Expert, uh -huh. premieres on Epics Friday night, 10 p.m. Uh -huh. 
Uh, and you were, were you serious when you said that it's free epics this yeah, weekend? Yeah, free epics this weekend. Was that because, like in celebration of your special? I don't think so. Uh, I think it has very little to do with my special, but I like to think that they knew the free trial weekend was coming this weekend, and so they thought, well, let's put our best stand-up special on that weekend yeah. so we get people hooked. And then they realized they had already aired that one, oh. so they just put mine on instead. <laughs> That's a sort of classic joke construction. Yeah, it was good. I'm going to write that down. What do you like most about doing stand-up compared to all the other things that you've done? Um, in my writer, it says you have to have Dr. Pepper mm -hmm. and uh, pretzels in my dressing room. And that's the only time where I know I'm going to show up and there's going to be Dr. Pepper and pretzels. That would make me do stand-up. It's great. For sure. It's great. Sometimes they ignore the writer. And the level of upset that I get is off the charts. Right. Because I ask for so little. So, a bag so of pretzels and some Dr. Pepper. I don't need, I don't need dancing girls. I don't need alcohol. I don't need uh, marijuana. All I want is some Dr. Pepper and some pretzels. Now, in the writer, it may specifically say rolled gold tiny twist pretzels. I was going to say what kind of pretzel matters. Rolled gold tiny tiny twists. Okay. Uh, if they want to do roll gold pretzel sticks, not logs, sticks, that would also be acceptable. Logs are, who eats the logs? I don't like the you, logs. I don't like them either. Uh, what but about a, a honey of, braided twist? No, don't, don't do that. Don't give me fancy pretzels. Okay. Um, and don't give me Snyder's pretzels. But what about the Snyder's bites, the honey mustard and onion flavor? No. no. Really good though. In a pinch, fine. Okay. But if I'm doing stand up, I have a ritual. That's my ritual. That's what I want. Dr. Pepper, rolled gold, tiny twist pretzels. It's rare, actually, that they get it right, that they get it exactly right. It's a shame. But when it happens, and there's, and when, it, when it happens the way it's supposed to, it's the best. Yeah, and it's just such a celebration for you. How did you, how do you go about writing your stand-up? Do you tour with it? Do you try it on people? Like, what's your process like? I write it down, mm. uh, say it in front of an audience, they don't like it, mm. and then I try to salvage something from it. Mm. That's how it generally goes. It, it's, it's a process of uh, standing up, falling down, standing up again. It's, uh, it's a lot like sports. Yeah, sure. Isn't that what they do in sports? Mm -hmm. Stand up, fall down, stand up? Isn't there a commercial about that? I, I, it was like a song like by Chumbawamba. <laughs> Right, that yeah. is what it's about. It is, it is. But I don't know about a, t about a commercial, I've never seen that commercial. Now how big of a sports fan are you? I'm a huge fan of the sports. I'm a big fan, I'm from Boston, so uh, it was like driven into me from a very young age. All sports? Uh, so my, my hierarchy is football, hockey, baseball, basketball. I don't mm. really care much about basketball. But you care about hockey? Yeah. My yeah. brother played hockey growing up, so yes. it was I was all in. I was a little rank rat. Right. You're not a, not a fan. No, I like sports, but but it it seems to me like if all I did all day, I'm not saying you do, mm -hmm. was think about, write about, tweet about, argue about sports, mm -hmm. I would go out of my fucking yeah. mind. Yeah. Well, the crazy thing is it's always been a, a for most people, it's what you watch when you're not working. And right. it, for me, it's work. So... Uh, yeah, I go out of my mind sometimes. I would. It would drive me crazy. And then I tweet about something else, and you get, stay in your lane. Right. Tweet about like sports, you get, stupid. You funny, funny man. And right. then it's like, oh, talk about football. Do you idiot. get a lot of sexist things being in sports? It's the worst, right? You would know, right? Uh, well, I get a lot of uh, uh, things, I mean, political things. I mean, you know, don't talk about politics. Mm. And with the Trump supporters, you Jew. Oh, God. A lot of that. Dear God. They seem like nice people. The best. They always are right Salt there to the earth. point out things about you that you already know. That are they, true. And they use them as like Slams. insults. But right. Well, like, they'll add adjectives to it. Mm. It's not just you're Jewish. Yeah. It's. You're dumb and Jewish. Mm. You're. Filthy. Ooh. Filthy Jew, that kind of thing. Christ. Yeah. That is just gross. Trump supporters. Mwah. How often are you reading your app mentions? Because I imagine oh, all they're. all the time. Really? I mean, I don't see them all. Right. You but couldn't. I, yeah. But I read them. Yeah. Like, how it's many my times did you say you check it? Like 10 times a day? More. Wow. It's my, it's my main news information entertainment source. Yeah. It's not healthy. I, I, it's definitely not healthy. I know I do that too. But it's, that's what I do. What if you're looking for your... And I play your, Boggle. Oh. Uh, like, online Boggle. Oh, okay. Online Boggle. 
I genuinely, I think I did that when the internet first started being a thing. Right. Like, I loved Boggle online. I yeah. just haven't seen it. Do you have, like, an app on your phone? Yeah. Oh, I'm getting that. EA Sports makes Boggle. Of course they do. Um, what When you see something in your replies, what compels you? Are there any specific types of tweets that you're like, oh, I'm going to respond to that person? Mm-mm. No, it's just whatever strikes my fancy. Yeah. I mean, I'm never going to respond to a compliment. I'm, if somebody's being really nice, I might... Star it, to yeah. just say, I noticed that and thank you. It's a heart now. It's a heart, yeah, whatever it is. Uh, but I don't, I don't respond to compliments. And, uh, but if somebody is particularly egregious or particularly stupid, I might respond. Um, or if somebody is particularly funny, I might respond. But I, I don't respond that much. I do sometimes. Do you you get into I, arguments? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I get into arguments. If, I, if somebody like gives me the alley and I can easily just oop it right in their face, right. I will. Right. Yeah. It's you'll, like you walked into that, so I'm going to make fun you'll of You'll take you. the high percentage shot. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes a little bit of low-hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. You know, got to do what you got to do. I think my metaphor was better because it's a sports show. It was. It was. <laughs> of all the things you've done, stand-up, podcast, TV show, movies, specials, I guess social media, am I missing any things? Did, What's, you, say, did you say books? Books. What's your favorite type of medium for comedy? What do you like? For comedy? Yeah. Like, what do you like being funny through the uh, most? Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, completely. A- any anything. I don't care. What's the easiest? What's the most fun? What's like, oh, I get to write a book. Oh, I get to send a funny tweet. People are going to love it. And well, I mean, response. obviously tweets are easiest. Yeah. Because it's, it's just brain farts. That's easy. But it's not lasting. So, I mean, the most satisfying ultimately is probably... Either is 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 either writing a book or a TV series or just having written something is the most satisfying, I would say. Okay. Having so written and performed all of those also are satisfying. Writing. Okay. You know. Yeah. You get it. I get it. I'm totally on your level with these things. So we end every podcast with something called the Garbage Ten. It's ten rapid fire, silly, weird questions. Are you ready? Are you, how how disappointed are you that I haven't been funny during this? You've been podcast? hilarious. What are you no, talking? I haven't. I haven't what even really you, been trying. First of all, anyone who tries isn't funny. You know that. If you try mm. too hard, ask old Michael. Right. Do less. Right. That's Second what I'm doing. Second of all, less. you've been hilarious. Mm. And third of all, the point of the podcast isn't really to be funny. It's I to get to know you as a person. That's and what I thought. Yeah, I just thought, want to pick oh, your brain for... He's going to come in and be so funny. I don't want to be funny. No, we already did the funny. I know, we I'm did tired. funny for TV. I'm tired too. Right. I don't even want to have to drill you on all this. I just want to learn from all you. All right, let's you've hear the so stupid questions. Well, I didn't say they were... You, didn't you say they were silly, stupid questions? Did I? <laughs> Number one. What was your first AOL screen name? I don't know. You didn't have AOL screen names? I'm sure I did, but how am I supposed to remember? You said you remembered the 9,000 shows you've been on. You don't remember the one screen name you had when you were trying to pick up chicks? Michael Ian Black? That's... I don't believe you. It probably was. What else would it be? Why wouldn't I use I my know. name? M-I-B? Like Men in Black? Mm, the, but those little... Those short little screen names would all have been taken by the time I signed up for AOL. Maybe. Because you're only 26. That's right. Right. I'm going to say probably Michael Ian Black. Okay. Ranch or Blue Cheese? Blue cheese. You say it as if it's like known in a fact. Yeah, it's a stupid question. Obviously, blue cheese. Why is it stupid? Because it's it, if you're gonna because look if you're gonna have ranch or blue cheese, it's because you're eating wings, and if sure. you're eating wings, celery or a carrot. If you're eating wings, you put blue cheese on that shit. You don't put ranch on it. So you We're, just let the man tell you what you're supposed to put on your. I don't like tell who, the man. The, the man who said it was blue cheese. It's blue cheese. Okay. You're just saying the words. Well, again. it's like, it's like, uh, there's certain laws. You know, the atom cannot be divided. We know now that it can be. But right. So this is a bad example to start with, probably. I'm going back to the Greeks. Right. The Greeks identified. They said there's a, there's a, a, a atomos. It cannot be divided. Mm. It, it, you get down to certain fundamental building blocks of nature. Mm. Uh, blue cheese and buffalo wings is one of those things. Okay. You can do. You can put ranch on them, but you're not going to have the full sensory experience. The blue cheese itself is, and it can't just be some shitty blue cheese. It has to be good blue cheese mm. with chunks of blue cheese in it. Mm. So you like put a chunk on top of the wing and then bite the wing. And you you also- can not necessarily. It may end up on the wing. It may not. Okay. But you know that the, you know there's always. A chance, and it's the chance, it's that element of luck and mm-hmm. good fortune mm-hmm. that elevates the experience of eating a buffalo wing from just a mindless snack to uh, a culinary adventure. 
The correct answer was ranch. Uh, what was <laughs> what was the first concert you ever went to? Um, I think Billy Joel at Madison Square Garden. I mean, that's an amazing first concert. Is it? Yeah. I mean, he's never played there since. He only did it that one time. <laughs> You're one of the few people who got yeah. to see Billy Joel. At Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden. What's your favorite Billy Joel song? Um, uh, She's Always a Woman to Me. Oh, that's a good one. Thanks. Yeah, good choice. That's not one of the questions. So we're going to make it 11 now because I asked you an extra You know, question. I took that that was 3A or okay, good. 2A or whatever good. it was. 3A, you were right. Who's your favorite superhero? As a kid... I mean, I'm so over the superhero thing. Mm. It's such a played out genre. Yeah. It's so exhausting to me yep. uh, culturally yep. that I resent that you even asked me the question. Okay. As a kid, yep. I liked the Wonder Twins, Jan and Zayna. Okay. So if you had to pick one, Jan or Zayna. They're a package. Well, I said, who is your favorite superhero? Zayna. I knew you'd pick one. Which of your kids is your favorite? <laughs> My son today. My daughter's being a total bitch right now. <laughs> she'll grow out of it, and then she'll grow back into oh, it. Oh, I know. She's, she's, she's done that many, yeah. many times. Oh, God. How old is she? She's about to turn 13. Really? Yeah. Oh, God. That was an age when I was a... I hated my dad at 13. Yeah, she's... It's not even that she doesn't like me so much. It's just she doesn't like anything right now. Mm. And, I, you know, I don't blame her. But I don't want to be around it. Don't I'm, blame you. Don't, I don't want to deal with it. Don't be around it. Do you put ketchup on top of your no, french fries? No, I don't use ketchup. Why not? I don't like it. Okay. I don't want a sweet condiment. It's not that sweet. It's sweet. I don't want a sweet condiment. I want a spicy or savory condiment. I never want, I don't like sweet relish and I don't like ketchup. Honey mustard? No. What is wrong with you? We just discussed, I don't want a sweet condiment. We discussed, you just said it. What do you, what do you Mustard give? on fries. Mustard. Always. What kind of, yellow mustard? Or it can be. I mean, if I'm having a steak frites, it's gonna be Dijon. Wow. You sound rich. <laughs> yeah. When you put your Dijon on your frites, do you put it on top or on the side? Uh, it depends how the mustard is served. If the mustard is served in a little container, it goes on the side. And Dijon is almost always served in a little container. You're never going to get a squeeze bottle of Dijon. But if it's a squeeze bottle, then it goes on top. Because you can control the flow. And then do you eat your french fries with a fork? Uh, no. Uh, uh, no. But you're, not you're just not afraid to get mustard on your fingers? I can get a little bit of mustard on my fingers. I'll be alright. Okay. What's your guilty pleasure television show? Embarrassed to admit that you watch. None. I don't have any that I'm embarrassed to watch. I only watch high quality television. I don't have a lot of time to sit around and watch television. I don't watch fucking Bravo Housewives <laughs> shit or any of that garbage. Yeah. Uh, what about the, do you watch this garbage time? This show? Uh, I will say this about your show. I'd never heard of it before today. <laughs> but I'm a big fan. Oh, thank you. I just was waiting. I knew it was coming. <laughs> do you floss before you brush Wait, your teeth? Wait, it's garbage time. Oh, goodness. So what you so, so what we did that was a segment on garbage time. Yeah. What else is going to be on garbage time? So it'll well so that episode it's going to be this week's. Um, it'll be I played video games with Richard Sherman from the Seahawks. We mm -hmm. played Call of Duty. I like That'll that guy. There. Uh, last week. How we, do you not like that guy? Oh, I, he's fantastic. The best. He's so great. He's going to have a great career in broadcasting, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, he is. I can't tell if you're being serious. No, he, I'm being yeah, dead, deadly yeah, serious. Yeah, yeah. He's very very. I'm being kind. deadly serious about Richard <laughs> Sherman, right? Uh, and we also, last week, we did a thing where we raised $10,000 to buy or donate a bench in Central Park to David Ortiz because he's retiring. And so, like, a kind of a piss-off Yankee fans thing. And we raised the money in, like, 48 hours, so we're going to, like, talk about that a That's little fun. bit. Yeah. That and sounds then, like uh, a good show. Yeah, it's just a silly little... Sounds Emmy-worthy. It is. We'll find out. I don't think I've ever watched Fox Sports 1. I think that's probably why I don't know it's the show. It's tough to find. Well, I don't really watch much sports television. Yeah. I like, I like the HBO one. With Brian Gumble. Yep, real sports. And I watch a lot of baseball. I watch the Yes Network. Are you a Bill Simmons fan? Um, I can't say that I am or am not. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I'm not familiar enough with Bill Simmons yeah. to have an opinion. Because he's got an HBO show coming. I heard. Yeah. I heard. Should be interesting. I'm sure you'll do that. I like, like shows about sports more than I like watching sports. I like the human drama. Mm. 
the compelling storylines. Mm. But I'm not going to sit there and watch many games. For like hours and hours no, and hours. No, God, no. I know people who DVR games and watch them later. Of and course. it's weird to me. But don't you work with all those people? No, Isn't it? Some of them, yeah. But for me, it's like once I know who won, I'm good. Right. I don't need to watch it. Right. I don't have time. Right. You're going to the Emmys. Exactly. Uh, do you floss before you brush your teeth or after you brush your teeth? Always after. But then you get all the stuff in your teeth. Wait, what? You like you flick it out and then your mouth. You know what? Here's the no. As I think about it, I gen they're two they're generally two separate activities for me. Oh. I'll feel the need to floss and will floss. That exists independent of mm. brushing. Mm -hmm. So I don't have like a set time for flossing the way I do for brushing. Three p.m. You're a three p.m. flosser. Yeah. yeah, every day. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Yes. What was the last movie you went to see in the theater? <laughs> Captain America: Civil War. But you're over the My kids wanted to see it, so I went with them. And like every time I go to one of these things, people are saying, oh, it's great. Like, this is the best one. And you go, and you're like, oh, it's enough. They just Stop make hitting them, each other. They just make them to make the next one. And you feel that now when you're watching it. Like, oh, I get it. You're setting it up for the next one. Right, but what I understand is happening with movies, and particularly these kinds of movies, is they're just treating it like television. Yeah. So it's just, this is a season. So this season, Captain America and Iron Man are mad at each other. And the next season, Captain America is doing something else. Yeah. They're just seasons of television now. Like Batman v Superman made me angry, because why would they fight? And didn't also see that Superman one. would, I didn't watch it. Superman would just go like just, this and rip and off his dead. head. You're just <laughs> immediately dead. You're not a super here, you're a man with a lot of money, Batman. Right. So I'm going to. He's also money. in shape, and he ha and he's good at martial arts. Sure. But you can't go against God. Right. <laughs> like he could burn your face off with his eyeballs. Did you watch it? I didn't no, watch it. I didn't watch it. But we should definitely analyze it as if we did, because <laughs> right. We don't need to watch. I saw the trailer. That means I saw everything I needed. Right. The to. premise is bad. Yeah. It's a bad premise. Bad premise. Superman as a character is a bad premise. Agreed. Because then they had to start to come up with all these things. Well, oh well. So if you're on a planet with a Red Sun, or if you're, you know, if you have kryptonite, then he... He's too powerful. He's too problem. powerful. And then they had to write in... Okay, whatever. Last question. You're about to be put to death. First of all, sorry. Second of all, what's your final meal? Andre, dessert, and beverage. Uh, well, we know the beverage already. We do. It's obviously Dr. Pepper, right? Taco Bell, Taco Supreme. Ooh. Um... I don't want to put a number on it. I was going to say, not, you can't have just one. No, it's probably like six or eight. And then some kind of ice cream. Some kind of ice cream that's going to fart up the execution chamber. Mm. I mean, the Taco Bell's going to do that, too. Yeah, I mean, um, pistachio? I don't know. It's like a farty ice cream flavor. You know what I like? Uh, I, li I, like, I, like a, I like a Breyers Cookies and Cream, okay. which is not a high-quality ice cream, but I enjoy it. It's, it's, it's an ice milk, almost. Mm. Uh, or, or or a uh, it's a des it's like a it's a frozen dairy product. That's a exactly what it is. Product. Fair, frozen dairy product. Yeah. I think is what it is. Um, but then I also like lately the uh, Ben and Jerry's Stephen Colbert American Dream Cone. Is uh, that what it's called? Americone Dream. Americone Dream. It's close. That's my son got into that and then it's good. It's really good. It's really good. So maybe a gallon of that. A whole gallon. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, I would do it. Cool. Well, that's it. That's all I have for you. All right. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Sorry. For what? Just for being a downer. You're not a downer at all. This was fun. All right. Okay. I didn't mean to yell at you. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks again to MIB. He was dope. Such a cool guy. Real He's cool amazing. guy. Real, real cool guy. Uh, that means it's time for junk mail. You've got junk mail. Today's junk mail question comes from Marcin Garhat. Oh. I see what he did there. What did he do? Is his name Hat Hattie? His name oh. is Hattie Bo. Anyway, uh, Marcin asks, would you rather vote for Donald Trump in private or wear a Greg Hardy jersey in public? Oh, shit. Whoa. Oh, shit. Vote for Donald Trump in private. Yeah. Versus wear a Greg Hardy jersey in public. Well, so this Ooh. is like the timeless debate of, of like, sacrificing yourself for right. the greater good. It is. And there's also so many layers here. Like, yeah. first of all, if I voted for Donald Trump in private, no one would ever have to know. That's sure. the point, right? Yep, yep. And that doesn't mean Donald Trump is president. No. I know, Ashley. I know. No. I'm just walking through yeah. the options. You need I'm to break cringing, too. I'm being a professional about it. <laughs> So 
it's not a cause and effect directly. If I vote, if I end up choosing that I would vote for Donald Trump in private, it doesn't mean that Trump is president. But kids, every vote counts, so be sure exactly. to vote. But if I wear a Greg Hardy jersey in public, Damn. A, I look like a hypocrite, Damn. because it's not like I could explain to every person who saw me, like, no, no, it was either this or vote for Trump. No. I had to do this. No. You just have to wear it. Yes. And I'm assuming, I mean, he didn't have enough characters to be able to, to no. explain the whole situation, but I'm assuming this is like for a day yeah. or like on the show. Yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming also like you can't say, oh, I'm wearing this because I lost I have a to. bet. Right. I have to. Not allowed to give a reason. Right. I'm just supposed to wear because yeah. that's the pure, otherwise you can yeah. say whatever you want. Right. So A, I would look like a hypocrite. B, I'd be endorsing a, an awful man. But True. again, if I voted for Trump, same Z's. <laughs> So it's like, it's like, and also, a person who hates Greg Hardy wearing a Greg Hardy jersey, that's hard enough. But for a person who has publicly said that Greg Hardy's a bad person, and like people have told me that meant a lot to them, for me to wear a Greg Hardy would be even worse. True. Oh, Ooh, man. It makes it tougher, how like specific it is to you. I know. But obviously, like, if... If it were to come down to it, let's say after the day the votes are tallied and Donald Trump is president and they say, you'll never believe this. Mm. It was decided, it was by one vote, <laughs> which that's not how the electoral college works. So I don't think that that would happen. But if in any way I were to find out that my vote oh. was the vote that oh. put it over the edge, oh. I just don't know. I just don't so know that tough. I could. And also just to have to sleep at night. To know that like people fought and died for your right to vote and you used it to vote for Donald Trump oh. was like, nah, I don't oh. know. Now my mom's going to listen to this podcast and hate me because she is on a Trump kick right now, oh. which I don't even want to talk is, yeah. about. Yeah. But I don't know if I can vote for Trump. Oh, it's tough. But then you go like, well, no matter who was president, like they really don't have enough power that they could do. Like if Trump is president, he's going to be, what's it called, in like two months. Yeah. Murdered? Sometimes you, sometimes you forget words. <laughs> uh, assassinated was the word I was looking for. No, he's going to be impeached, like, immediately. If he does any of the things he's planning on doing, mm. we have checks and balances. He will immediately be impeached. So let's hope, like, his running mate is somebody dope. Yeah. <laughs> they become president. Uh, oh, God, this is, there's so uh, many layers. I don't, I don't know how to help you here. This is a tough one. Trump or Hardy? My God. <laughs> this is, like... Do you kill your firstborn? <laughs> oh. oh my God. I feel like, insert name of that guy in Game of Thrones who I'll never remember. Stannis Baratheon? Oh shit. Is that bro? right? He killed his kid? Yeah, bro. Spoiler alert for people who haven't gotten there yet. Oh God, that's yet. like seasons ago. And if I remember, then that means it's wow. a talked about thing. Katie I cannot believe I just remember this. Dropping accurate GOT I can, knowledge. I. I am so jealous wow. of people who know and understand Game of Thrones. It's too much for me, and I, I need to binge watch from the beginning and, and try to pay more attention. Because I usually watch TV with a phone in my hand. You it, can't do that with Game of oh, Thrones. No. There's too many fucking people. No. And I also have a theory that anyone who loves Game of Thrones understands 80% of it, max. Yes. 80% maximum. No one's crossing that threshold. Everyone's at 80. Most people are even lower than that. But because it's cool to like it and because there are some scenes where you don't need to know the rest of the shit, it's just really awesome, people love it. And I'm standing by that. Come at me on Twitter because I'm 80% of the show you understand. There are times where there's a scene on and you're going, mm-hmm, who is this guy? 100%. We haven't visited this part of Westeros <laughs> in a really long time okay, and I don't now. remember this man. That's what I'm wow. thinking most of the time. When yeah. we get to Khaleesi, I'm like, yes, I know this. I know what's happening here. Oh. I know about the dragons. I get it. But then I get a little sad because she doesn't show her boobs anymore. That's her yeah. personal choice. Anyway, back to Greg That's Hardy. Great. And I was hoping that maybe we could just not get back to no, the question. No, that was a really good uh, Stannis Baratheon uh, you Yeah, know, I feel like I took. have to make a sacrifice yeah. here. Okay. And therefore... How Your many people could is, I see in one day in a Greg Hardy jersey? Even if we wear it on TV, nobody watches our show. Clip might get shared online, and then yeah, it would get picked up like, by blogs, and people would be like, we knew Katie Nolan was a phony. Katie Nolan supports domestic violence. Jesus Christ, it's just so many bad things. And one vote for Trump wouldn't make a difference. I'm, I'm going to cheat. I was going to say I would vote for Donald Trump and pay somebody to vote 
to counteract it. I would find somebody else who was gonna vote for Trump and pay them to vote for whoever I was gonna vote for, which still don't know. <laughs> um, all right. Is that th- cheating? Like it's it kind of it kinda is, it's but cheating. this is such a hard question no, that like it's cheating. I... That's cheating. That's like saying I'd wear a Greg Hardy jersey and I'd tape over the back of it so okay. nobody would know. <laughs> all right. Also, just like it's a Cowboys jersey. That in and of itself is oh, yeah. bad. Greg Hardy's not in the league anymore, so he doesn't have a jersey, so I couldn't wear one in public. So I'll pick that option. No, Kenny, <laughs> these are all cop outs. I don't want to pick one. What would you pick? I would. For me. For you? For you, you'd wear a Greg Hardy jersey. You wouldn't give a shit. See, honestly, I would pick the Donald Trump, voting for Donald Trump in private and just knowing or hoping that uh, my one vote didn't sway the election. And then I would deal with the consequences after if it did. Yeah, I, I know. And that's just such a, I'm going to get shit for that take, that one vote doesn't count. Because it, it does. does. It matters. But <sighs> I found voting. I just right. think I'd get into the booth and go, I can't do it. Right. I can't do it. I can't do it. I would vote for Donald. <sighs> this is like, this are is you great. a good person when great. everyone's looking and a bad person when no one's right. looking? Like, is, that's why it's an amazing question. I know. Yeah. I hate you, Marcin Gorhat. <laughs> Love the pun, hate the main I question. hate you, Hattie Bo. <laughs> All right. I would Fine vote up. for Donald Trump in private. I am an awful person. I'm an awful person, but I, if I can't explain myself in a Greg Hardy jersey, right. everything I it's ever stood up for, I look like I'm full of shit, right. and then I have no ground to stand on. Right. And Trump would never win. Okay, that's it. That's not a fun note to end the fucking podcast on. I just privately voted for Donald Trump. <laughs> That was a tough one. Oh my that god! That ranks up there. Maybe the toughest junk mail question ever. Would so. you rather's are always like yeah. really good discussions and also really hard to pick. They're tough. They're tough. We should do like a would you rather segment on the show. Ooh. We can't call it would you rather because like that's been done. But like think on I, that pun I guy. I think we can come up with the title. Think cool. on that. If not, I'll hit up Marcin Gorhat to help. <laughs> Dave loves puns. I don't know if anybody knows that. I Producer know. Dave loves puns. That's a good show. By the good end right of here. me with my goodbye read, I want you to have a pun name for a segment about would you rather. Okay, okay? Oh, shit. here we go. Okay. That's it guys, we'll be back to this again next week. Make sure to subscribe on iTunes and rate us and leave a comment, uh, but only if it's five stars and a nice comment because I have a mink coffin and it's really cool and I shared it with you and I, you guys can all have one if you want. A Emmy coffin, not an Emmy. Oh, you can have an Emmy, because why would you need a coffin? Uh, or you can listen on Google Play, uh, Art19, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or a magic bullet. I had a magic bullet. It's, a, it's like a small blender. It's a personal <laughs> small blender, and it now gets podcasts. Uh, thanks again to Michael Ian Black. Thank you to producer Dave, producer Ashley on sound. Uh, thanks to all of you guys for listening. Dave? Um, the only thing I got is that it would be called Would You Rather, and that um, one of the options would always have to be Dan Rather. <laughs> thanks for listening, guys. Bye. I love you. Mean it. <laughs> I came up with a pun name for a Would You Rather segment. It's called Would You Rather.